Today, we're furthering that conversation about 1031 exchanges. And we're going to be talking about different replacement property options you have, some strategies to identify different replacement opportunities. And then we're also going to be talking about opportunity zones and how this kind of rolls into this fold of a 1031 exchange or another option or even an option for those that are maybe selling part of their business or something like that. So to do this, we have brought back Mike Shear from RCX Capital Group, who is an expert on this topic. And if you missed our previous episode, check that out where we talked about 1031 exchanges, kind of deep dove into things you need to know about those. But now we're just continuing that conversation. Again, this is the idea that if you are someone that has sold real estate, this is a topic and opportunity that you want to be thinking about. So Mike, welcome back to the show. Great to be here. Thanks, Mike. And I know we got some legal things that we need to cover, so I'll let you kind of knock those out so that we can get to the content right away. Appreciate it. RCX Capital Group and the opinions expressed by RCX Capital Group on this podcast are their own and do not reflect the opinions of any other third party. All statements and opinions expressed are based upon information considered reliable, although it should not be relied upon as such. Any statements or opinions are subject to change without notice. Information presented is for educational purposes only and does not intend to make an offer solicitation for the sale or purchase of any specific securities, investments, or investment strategies. Investments involve risks and unless otherwise stated are not guaranteed. Information expressed does not take into account your specific situation or objectives and is not intended as, a rec- as recommendations appropriate for any individual. Listeners are encouraged to seek advice from a qualified tax, legal, or investment advisor to determine whether any information presented may be suitable for their specific situation. Past performance is not indicative of future performance. Thanks, Mike. Excellent. So last episode, we talked about this idea of a 1031 exchange, and we know that a major part of that exchange piece is finding a property. Finding a property that you're going to take the proceeds from the property that you sold and put them into or invest into this new property. So let's talk about some of those replacement property options and what are some strategies that you work with individuals that are going through that 1031 exchange, have that property that they sold, and are at that step now of looking for that, identifying that property and looking for the replacement property. Yeah, happy to, Mike. So whenever someone is contemplating a 1031 exchange, I like to break it down into three distinct choices, right? And this is where understanding the investor's goals and objectives and working with their tax advisor is critical. Option one is do nothing and pay tax, which I tend to think is not a very good option. I'm thrilled guys like you are out educating <laughs> folks on what not to do. And then the second option is how does that investor want to invest? So what does the second leg of their exchange journey look like? And they have two distinct choices as it relates to replacement property at a primary level. I know this can get a little more complex, but for the purpose of this podcast, the first one is investing in a security that would be passive that qualifies as a 1031 exchange. And the primary structure that's used today is something called a Delaware Statutory Trust, and that is fractional ownership in institutional quality real estate. That could be something like a multifamily complex. It could be self-storage units. But this is where a sponsor purchases that institutional quality real estate and then syndicates it, where an investor can invest as little as 100000 within their 1031 exchange into that qualifying real estate. They can design and build diversified portfolios. Their ownership is passive. And a lot of investors like this option because they have some certainty of close, right? They can go, they can find this investment, they can click, invest now, and then that's done. What they don't like about this, because they're a passive investor, is they don't have disposition control. So they could be invested in this investment for six, seven, eight, nine, 10 years. All of the disposition control is held at the sponsor level. The other option is they can invest directly in real estate. There's a lot of strategies available to investors. They can invest in commercial real estate. Perhaps they want to invest in a car wash, then combine that with a cost seg study, or they can invest in a single family rental. But these strategies are more active, right? This is where either on a triple net lease property, they're going to have to have everything in place. On a single family rental, they're going to need to find property management. And there's going to be added expenses as it relates to hiring uh, or they're going to be actively doing all that work. So it just depends on what that investor wants to do and 
how involved in their investment real estate do they want to be? Yeah, and I think that's that's such a key point because I think a lot of people they build up this portfolio, and let's say you have this apartment complex that you're looking to sell now, and you're just looking to get out. Of it. You want to relax. You want to stop handling kind of day to day dealing with tenants, dealing with all that. And so they come into this exchange and saying, "Well, I like the idea of an exchange." because it allows me to defer my gain, but that just means that I need to get back into this idea of being a landlord. And it's not something I want to do. And so what I'm understanding here is that Delaware Stitch, their Delaware Statutory Trust is an option that qualifies as part of the 1031 exchange that allows you to get out of maybe a, a property that you are actively managing to now be able to take that backseat role and be more of a passive investor in it. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head. That's and that's the key. And that's where we we have discovery calls. We're learning about the exchangers. If they come and tell me and they say, Hey Mike, I'm really sick of dealing with the toilets and all the plumbing and and all this stuff, then maybe the answer for that exchanger is have you looked at passive investment options, things like a Delaware statutory trust? And have you thought about maybe diversifying into a portfolio of Delaware statutory trust? And that's typically where that conversation begins. Okay. Now, when we talk about this idea of, of a 1031 exchange and then deferring that capital gain, we always kind of talk about this idea of that upon death of an individual, whoever is inheriting that property will get a step up in basis, which is a beautiful thing because now they can go ahead and sell that property and have potentially no capital gains on it at all. And that takes a bunch of deferring of 1031 exchange and creates a great thing for the people that are inheriting that. Now, you talked about a Delaware statutory trust and not being able to have as much control over it, which is a good thing if you want to be a passive investor. What would happen upon the death if the people that are inheriting that piece want to just sell everything and take the cash out at that point? Is that still possible for them or is that something that they would have to wait until the organizer decided that, that they were going to disband that? Yeah. So it would, they need to wait for the sponsor to ultimately run full cycle on that and, and sell, sell the asset, but they would receive again, they would be working with their tax advisor. Don't consider this as tax advice, but they would receive a step up in the basis just as they would if it were some other direct investment property. Okay. Now let's go back to the the idea of a 1031 exchange, because I think it just plays along with this when we're talking about a Delaware statutory trust. If I am currently a passive investor in a syndicated real estate project, is that something that I'm looking to now sell my interest or they're looking to now, now return the funds? Is that something that would qualify for a 1031 exchange? Yeah, great question. And, and typically how I handle this, Mike, because it, it can be complex. There's a lot of different investment vehicles out there. This is where a qualified intermediary and the investor's tax advisor really play a role, right? And this is where digging in, what do you actually own and is it 1031 eligible, right? And that's where without knowing the details and without mm -hmm. having a tax advisor or the qualified inter intermediary look at it, I'd be providing bad advice. Yeah, no, that makes sense. This episode is brought to you by Taxum. At Taxum, we understand that saving taxes can be complex and overwhelming for business owners. That's why we're here, to be that tax strategist in your back pocket ensuring that you pay the least amount of taxes as legally possible. With TaxZone, you receive a tax savings blueprint tailored to your business needs, unlimited access to our team of tax experts, and an annual one-on-one -on -one live consultation. You'll also have access to our comprehensive training with videos, downloads, templates, workbooks, guides, and so much more, along with our monthly live trainings to keep you informed and in control. Thousands of business owners across the country trust TaxZone. It's time you did too. Visit us now and take that first step towards paying the least amount in taxes as legally possible. There has never been a better time to join TaxSum. Do not forget about our 30-day money-back guarantee. We guarantee that we will present tax saving strategies that will, at a minimum, cover the cost of your subscription fee or your money back. This is your risk-free invitation to explore the benefits of TaxSum membership and how it can transform your approach to tax planning and savings. Go to TaxElm.com. That is T-A-X. ELM.com. Now back to the show. So the again, we look through this idea of a, a 1031 exchange, and it sounds like there's some really cool options. When we look into exiting a property and identifying replacement property options, we can choose to be direct ownership, and that would be 
as an example, going back into a single family resident or going into a, a multi-unit property or getting into laundromats or car wash, or we can choose a Delaware statutory trust. And that's going to be more of a passive type investment where there is a sponsor that is doing the work of the day to day. Is that kind of qualifies kind of what you look at as some of the main options and decisions that you have to make is kind of what lane do I want to go down in this 1031 exchange process after my sale? Yeah. So I I initially think you're spot on. You're kind of thinking about what lane, but I don't think it's it's an either or. It's how together the strategies can be mm. used to, to deliver better results. And, and let me just give you a quick example of that, Mike. Let's just say you have an exchanger and they found and they sold their relinquished property for $5 million, but they found a dollar tree that was selling for $4 million. So that'd be a triple net lease commercial. So they have another million dollars that they need to invest. That investor could build a portfolio of DSTs with that million dollars mm. and then achieve full tax deferral. So when I think about what an exchanger's goals are, they're out there working, they're out there working with their broker to find the best replacement property. They shouldn't feel like they need to have a direct match. They can purchase something for less and then backfill it with with DSTs to again, get that full tax deferral. So that. that is one reason why I encourage RAs that we work with to network with real estate brokers, understand how the strategies work together right? To deliver better results for the investor. So that's just one example. Another really important thing that we try to educate investors on is if they're out there looking for a fee simple property, they should also consider identifying a Delaware statutory trust as a backup plan, as almost an insurance policy, right? So if you think about, hey, I'm going in, I've identified this property, I've, I've shared it with the QI, you should also identify a DST. So when you go in for the inspection on that, that possible replacement property, if something comes up, you have something else you can close on so you're not paying the tax bill. So you get that deferred. Mm-hmm. So we try to really look at a granular level what the goals and objectives are and help clients design and build ID portfolios that fit their goals. Yeah, I love that idea. And that, and that that truly is the power about working with someone that like like you guys. And this is why when it comes to 1031 exchanges, we know there's some complexities in it and, and we want to get in front of the experts because those are some things that that individuals, investors don't think about just naturally of saying, oh, I saw I have a five million dollar proceeds that I need to reinvest. I need to find specifically properties that add up to $5 million, where you're saying there's there's alternative options in there that we can backfill that with the DSTs if we just can't find that $5 million total that we need. So I, I love that idea. Yeah. And it's always this rule, equal or greater, right? You all, you can you can invest more proceeds in, in the next leg of your journey, but you always want to take the proceeds that you have, invest at least that or more. And that's, that's the general rule. And there's so many unique options available to investors that when we meet clients and we're working with their with their team, just understanding what their liquidity needs are, things like that. Do they have debt to be replaced? Using DSTs, you can design a portfolio to get the debt pretty close, if not square on, so you replace that debt because a lot of DSTs come with financing that's already in place. Mm-hmm. There's also other unique strategies. So if you have someone who is real estate rich, but cash poor, that could really impact what sort of investment you make, whether or not you might want to refinance that or use a DST that might have some refinancing options. And we've seen both of those within the market. And again, that's where the planning and decision making really plays a role. Excellent. Now, when we talk about 1031 exchanges, another topic that has come up or an option available out there is this idea of an opportunity, a qualified opportunity zone. So Mike, can you kind of explain what is a qualified opportunity zone from a high level? Yeah, happy to. So a qualified opportunity zone came out with with the JOBS Act. And essentially, there was a tax deferral component of it, where if you had an eligible gain, whether that's, and we're just talking about the gain portion. So the first distinction is when you're doing a 1031 exchange, 
you're talking about all the proceeds from the sale of real estate. When you're talking about opportunity zones, you're talking about the gain portion and what the tax advisor would determine are eligible gains. And what it allows you to do is it allows you to defer the tax on that gain until 2026. I believe there is some legislation out there looking to possibly extend that to 2028, but I think it's nothing's been determined. And then where the real power of an opportunity zone comes in, in, in my opinion, is on the back end. When you invest that gain into a qualified opportunity zone project, and that could be a fund of multiple things or a specific project, if you hold that for 10 years, you pay no capital gains tax on the back end. So it allows you to basically take capital that might be tied into a 1031 exchange or in real estate, put it in this vehicle, and then you're investing in that opportunity zone. And if you meet the holding period, the gain on that is entirely tax-free. So we see this as a useful strategy when people are selling businesses, but also if someone failed in their 1031 exchange, it can be a backstop for a failed 1031 exchange. It could give them a different option. But I want to stress, they will still owe a tax bill on the gain that the advisor, the tax advisor will still need to plan for. Got it. it, it unless they hold it for the 10-year period? So so the gain, there's going to be a tax bill owed on the gain portion, but they're able to defer it until 2026. Okay. All right. So so planning for that tax liability, I think, is super important. But now they take that that gain. Let's just say it's a million dollars. They invest it in a qualified opportunity zone project. If they hold that for 10 years and it grows to three million, they play they pay no tax on the gain portion of that second leg of the investment. Got it. Makes sense. So let's go through an example again. Like we've used an example earlier where in a previous episode where you had a property that you purchased for 400,000, you depreciated it $250,000. So your basis in that is $150,000. And let's say we sell that property for a million dollars. Our gain on that is $850,000. With a 1031 exchange, we would have to invest that million dollars to completely eliminate the capital gain, that, that the sale proceeds of a million dollars. But you're saying with a qualified opportunity zone, we would only do need to invest that gain piece, that $850,000 would the, be the only thing that needs to be invested. But that gain, the capital gain on that $850,000 would be deferred until 2026, at least until as of current legislation. Correct. And if we invest that $850,000 into a qualified opportunity zone, we will not have to pay capital gain taxes until 2026, which will then have to pay capital gain taxes on that $850,000. But now let's imagine that $850,000 turns into $2 million and we hold it for 10 years. We can get out of that qualified opportunity zone 10 years from now when that's now worth $2 million and pay no capital gain on that difference. That's correct. Once the investment runs full cycle, again, it's up to the sponsor to, to ultimately sell that, that investment. That is absolutely correct. Now, when we look at qualified opportunity zones, does this, is it the same as with a 1031 exchange where the gain has to be coming from a real estate transaction or can this be any type of uh, asset that we're selling? It's That's a, the best question. It can be an any eligible gain. So it can be from the sale of stock. Um, maybe you had Amazon and it's, it's you're sitting on $2 million in gain. So, so that's where working with the tax advisor looking at your eligible gains, that is where that conversation should come in. Come mm -hmm. in. Also with the sale of businesses, right? We see a lot of interest when someone is selling a business because let's just say, for example, it's a car dealership, right? There's going to be a lot of land attributed to that, to that business that could be eligible for a 1031 exchange, but there might be also business elements that could be qualified eligible gains that together with your tax advisor we might be able to mitigate with an opportunity zone or at least defer, but get that investor into another investment that might reach a better return profile for them. Got it. Now, what when we look at a qualified opportunity zone, what qualifies as a qualified opportunity zone? So what type of projects are we typically looking at that, that qualify as a qualified opportunity zone? Yeah. So when we're looking at qualified opportunity zones, basically there's a publicly available map. And what was determined is they designed and, and chose areas that were economically depressed. So when you're 
investing in a qualified opportunity zone, not all qualified opportunity zones are created equal, right? Some are in relatively good areas, but you got to think of the underlying drive for why they created this. They want investors to invest in areas where they're trying to create job growth, maybe revitalize um, a neighborhood. So qualified opportunity zones, in my opinion, should be considered a higher risk. And they're typically Mm going to be development opportunities because that's where the 10 years and trying to get the most value tends to be in the entitlements, ground up development, getting it stabilized, and then ultimately selling uh, the finished project. Now, we specialize primarily in real estate related opportunity zones. There are businesses and, and things like that that could be qualified opportunity zone projects, but that's not something that we underwrite, but something that I think your audience should know about. Yeah, no, that's excellent. So kind of what we talked about these past two episodes is looking at this 1031 exchange. What are some of the things that that real estate owners need to know about into that exchange? And it's a super powerful tool that we have. But now we've also talked about, okay, now that we are looking at this 1031 exchange, how do we determine what type of properties we want to identify? What are some of our options? And I think you gave some really good examples that kind of explain some of that thought process and and those lanes that people can start to look down and getting connected with someone like RCX Capital Group to go through those options with them has been incredibly helpful. And then we also looked at this opportunity zone, this idea of how can we defer a gain as well as potentially invest in a qualified opportunity zone, hold it and have the gain from that opportunity zone, not not have to pay taxes on that as well. And so a lot of powerful options. Maybe if you're selling a business, it's a combination of multiple different options here. But I think that this has been a really good high level overview of that, just to get some of that initial gears thinking. And really the next step is, is if you're in this lane, you're in this situation where you're going through a real estate sale, you're going through a business sale, now is the time, especially getting ahead of that that actual sale, now is the time to get connected with a group like Mike. And, and what they do has been incredible. We have clients that we've sent to them that they've helped walk through this process with them and they've been super helpful along this journey. So if you're interested in, in learning about this, interested in digging deeper, again, this is something you want to touch on prior to a sale. So if you're kind of even starting that route of looking at a sale of real estate, looking at a sale of your business, start this process now, get connected with Mike and his team and and start to go down this process. So the options are available and then you can be prepared to set this up correctly. And so if you're interested in getting connected with Mike, you can email us at ask at tax savings podcast.com. I'll get an introduction out email out to you. Mike is also going to be joining us on our month, one of our monthly group trainings in Tax Helm. We're going to take this information, kind of deep dive even further. And so if you want so to access some of that information, you can check that out at taxelm.com. But Mike, I just want to say thanks for coming on. And I'll kind of leave you with the last word on this whole topic of 1031 exchange, identifying property in this qualified opportunity zone that we talked about as well. I'll kind of leave you with the last word and, and some advice that you have for our listeners. Yeah. So again, really appreciate the opportunity to participate in this podcast. And I think if I'm going to leave anything for your investors, it's the following. It really all comes down to planning. And, and understanding what your individual objectives are. Again, we like to work within a team framework and framework involving proper tax advisors. And really important, a lot of the time that we spent is free of charge, right? So it, there's, there's no harm in reaching out to, to Mike and scheduling a call and just learning about your options. We really enjoy being a resource. We enjoy being objective, listening to each and every client's goals, and then trying to provide the best advice we can to help you make the best tax advantage real estate decision that you can. Whether that is a 1031 exchange or you're looking to sell a business, we're there to help and be a resource to you along that journey. Yeah, and we appreciate that, Mike. And again, thanks for coming on and kind of deep diving into this topic. And listeners, I will see you next week. This has been another episode of the Small Business Tax Savings Podcast. If you enjoy our weekly episodes, please leave a review and share with other business owners. You can find previous episodes and more information at www.taxsavingspodcast.com. Thanks for listening and have a great day.